Hello everyone and hello from Oxfordshire in England. I'm Hugo Slim and I have the great pleasure of hosting this panel this afternoon in, in the Berlin Congress on building mutual trust and it's a great pleasure to be in the Berlin Humanitarian Congress. I always think that it's the best humanitarian event of the year. It has the most frank discussions and it also is the most fun event as one would expect in Berlin. So I hope you've all had a great week and enjoyed everything so far. Um, we are here to discuss building mutual trust, which is a theme that must have run through the week. And of course, trust is key to partnerships. And that's one of the things the humanitarian system is trying to get right in a new way um, for the future. And trust is key to partnerships within organizations and between organizations. And of course, it's essential to trust different parts, different organizations, different people, people within our organizations when we are trying to decolonize aid, when we are trying to create effective localization, when we are trying to get better accountability, deal with corruption, both international and national, when we are trying to root out sexual exploitation and abuse, we need trust and be able to trust each other, trust leaderships to set examples. And of course, other forms of terrible attitudes and behaviors, bullying, harassment and everything. So building mutual trust is a key issue for the sector. And it's a real pleasure to chair this meeting and to have three great people to discuss it with us. Um, let me introduce the panel. You can see them, I hope. We have Babita Alec, who's in Delhi and who is the operations manager of Caritas India. And we also have Florine Klomigar, who is the director of operations for AIRD, which is African Initiatives for Relief and Development, speaking to us from France. And just thanks to her mobile phone, because we were having IT problems, which is why we're a bit late. We're really pleased that Leela Ramdani can join us, who is the associate director of Confederation Development uh, for Oxfam, and she's with us from South Africa. So thank you all for coming, panelists, and thank you all for joining us remotely uh, for this session. And just to remind you, please use the hashtag, hashtag um, HC Berlin, if you're tweeting or doing anything else. And please also use the chat bar to discuss with others along the, along the side of this event. Um, and also, uh, please remember those of you who need it or want it, there is sign interpretation, international sign interpretation. So we have three main questions to address today. Um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to each panelist, give them three minutes each, ask them a question, have a brief discussion, and then we'll pick up your questions. So I look forward to those questions coming in or your comments. The first sort of fundamental question we're looking at is how do we create better, more trustful partnerships and increase mutual power sharing in the humanitarian sector. The second one is how can donors, international and national organizations make the most of their comparative advantage? How can they trust each other to deliver and do what each party does best? And then finally, is trust enough to really empower local actors? Is trust part of the solution? Is it the solution? Is it not enough? So those are the things we're, we're looking at. And I'm going to start um, with Babita in Delhi, um, who will speak from her experience in you know, the great Catholic network, Caritas International. Babita, tell us your, your first thoughts on this question of building mutual trust. Thank you, Hugo, for uh, you know, inviting me to speak. So I would just talk about from the perspective of uh, Caritas fraternity, and more so in the context of India, uh, the whole family of Caritas believes in the a sense of partnership. What we do here is more of leveraging and harnessing the opportunities amidst the partners and ensuring that we are creating a sense or a culture of transparency, culture of openness in terms of our work. So uh, in Caritas, we do not believe in the concept of donor and implementer because that itself creates a kind of a divide, a man management and a bureaucratic divide. So we'll speak more about humanitarian change makers. That's what the kind of, in a sense, is all about. 
And um, we are also inspired by this uh, encyclical, which has come from Pope Francis, which is the recent uh, Fratelli Tutti, which basically speaks more about people and institutions. The more the contribution of people and institutions in any given sector of operations. And that is what Caritas would base their work on, wherein we talk of people first and it should be community led. So this mutual trust will only come in when each of us have this shared mandate, a common mandate that, you know, whatever the work that we are doing, humanitarian work on operation that we are leading, should be community led and it should be community owned. It's the community, the people first, that should be definitely the prime agenda. So the shared agenda is something which uh, Caritas focuses on. Uh, the second one is on the uh, scope of dialogue and negotiation. I believe a lot of dialogue and negotiations are required during peace times more than during the time of crisis. It is during these peace times in creating a kind of a cultural preparedness wherein organizations from different sectors are coming together. We also have the community voices joining in and wherein a scope is being created for people to talk of what kind of uh, uh, support that they would require, what kind of uh, engagement that these different stakeholders should have. So this would kind of create a more of a complementarity of the work that we need to engage in, uh, whether it's a donor or an implementer or even the community that we are reaching out to. And of course, this aspect of reinforcing than replacing. I believe this culture of uh, replacing the existing systems and you know coming up with new ideas, it's good. But then sometimes it's very important that we give and, uh, you know, we kind of uh, harness as well as give a lot of space to the existing systems that is already there, the existing rich resources that are available. And rather than replacing, talking more of building and reinforcing those uh, experiences which are there. That also kind of leads to a lot of mutual trust in midst of the partnerships. And definitely, yes, um, a behavioral change, a behavioral culture, a sensitivity towards uh, you know each 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 other uh, it's not only when we are dealing with the community but also within partnerships how sensitive and how you know culture specific we are our behavioral you know perspectives how do we take our perspectives and our attitudes so that is something which we also believe in that would kind of create a scope for building this mutual trust in that's the partnerships of course the last one which i would rest here would be on compliances I believe uh, sometimes the danger is always that, you know, how my resources are going to be used or whether this resources are going to reach the way it needs to be, you, uh, you know, uh, reached out to. So I believe in during peace times, it's very important that we start looking into compliances and looking at ourselves, each organization looking into their own compliances and trying to also create a validation a mechanism of validation which helps to understand that yes it's easy to partner with organizations because they are already um, they are well compliant and they are already validated you know by uh, different networks which are there in the countries available so these would be some of the areas which from caritas perspective we would be looking at and we already engaged with so yeah from my side Leela, thank you. Uh, Babita, thank you very much. I'm, I'm just going to ask you a quick follow up because I'm very it's intriguing how you're trying to get rid of the binary distinction between donor and implementer. And I think that must be right. And to form a, a bigger sense of we, not an us and then the them in that process. But how does that work with international power realities when there are some members of the Caritas network who are realistically bigger in dollar terms and bigger in influence terms, like, for example, India itself or the US. How can um, those communities you talk about trust the big decisions made internationally? Do you have a so sort of as, representative yeah. model? Or, yeah. Sure. So, Hugo, as I mentioned, so this all happens during the peace times, you know, so there is this whole uh, process wherein the collaboration is not specific to a crisis. The collaboration happens through the preparedness measures wherein we have working groups, we have, you know, a kind of a common platforms where we are bringing our expertise, where we are talking and sharing ideas. We are bringing our context to the, you know, the international fora, talking about the kind of situation that is there. We have vulnerability mappings, hazard mappings. So we have all these researches which are already there available. A lot of research that goes into, you know, research and development which goes into these kind of situations. And that is already brought to the fore during these preparedness times, the peace times. And at that point of time, of course, there are negotiations that happen. You know, the, 
the international organizations come with certain kind of their perspectives. They have their tools and the means, but then they do not have the reach. So this is where people like the like you know the organizations like Caritas India bring that kind of a, a leveraging window wherein we bring thoughts together and see how which is a common pathway that we can take on. Of course, there is a lot of negotiations required. It is not a one-time affair. It does take a lot of uh, you know back and forth communication. You need to also journey along with them to ensure that you know that they are understanding the situation to be able to make changes within their own uh, mechanisms and approaches. So that is what we work on. Elita, that's really helpful, and thank you for that. I think there's some strong messages there about dissolving that, you know, unhelpful power distinction between, you know, donors and implementers. But this really strong message that trust is, we, we think of trust as an emotion, really, but actually you're making the point that trust has to be well organized in advance of a crisis. It has to be shaped, built, agreed, and felt um, well in advance. It's not something you can suddenly do when you need to do it. So, so thank you very much for that, that strong starting point. Florine, can we listen to your experience and your sort of golden rules coming out of your experience with AIRD in Africa? Sure, so uh, to prepare this, I had time to consult all my staff, the directors, uh, program managers and operation managers. I also spent some time with uh, the Association of, of convert for the convergence of trust. Um, and they spent some time with Julia Lepetit, which is a trust consultant. And so that we discussed a little the idea of trust and in the AGO sector. And we I had the chance to speak with um, somebody who worked for donors for a long time, um, the partnership manager for director for UNHCR, uh, Fatima. Uh, Sharif Noor and Benjamin Vite to discuss trust. So this is kind of um, the conclusion of a discussion um, between few people and my staff as well, directors and so on. So we started with the idea that we had to define trust and you know, trust is the reliance on the integrity, on uh, the honesty of, uh, on the strength, the ability, the certainty of a person or things to deliver. And, but, you know, when I discussed with um, Julian, he said, you know, trust is a feeling, it's like love, and it cannot therefore be measured. But he said, it's not blind trust. And so you have to uh, test it. You have to um, look deeply into and assess people and test them. So I, I looked at the humanitarian accountability report as I was preparing for this, and I read something that was very interesting, is that, you know, you have to trust, but verify. It's a Russian saying, and, you know, the Russian saying has the benefit of being applicable to many different situations, but also to the humanitarian sector. So trust is essential, to its functioning and during and to the functioning of the humanitarian sector and enduring trust cannot exist without accountability. So um, as I was, you know, looking at the, the humanitarian uh, accountability report for uh, 2020, the, some of the key ideas were verification, reporting, accountabilities are essential to make uh, the humanitarian work and aid function and humanitarian per, uh, partnership effective. So I kind of explore the idea from, you know, um, our point of view as staff and our, you know, the donor's point of view and, you know, trust consultant's point of view and my own views. So when I ask my staff, what does mean, you know, building trust uh, in the humanitarian sector for you, they came up with wonderful ideas. You know, the first one is effective uh, management of the partnership. So that's contribute to building trust. So these are not trust itself, but these are tools, project management tools, effectiveness tools that help build trust. So um, effective management uh, of partnerships means principle of partnerships, so equality, transparency, result-oriented approach, responsibility, complementarity. All these are the statements, the commitment of a good partnership. So these, they say, were key. And then they talked about you know, um, uh, this has to be evidenced through open communications and good leadership. So when we talk about open communications, it's just that, you know, uh, mutual understanding, 
honest communication, collaboration, all this foster trust. And of course, there should be mechanism for robust, regular feedback. Then they talked about leadership and of course, exemplary leadership, commitment to honesty, uh, integrity, service to others, transparency and respect of the staff, the beneficiaries, um, you know, the leadership has to walk the talk. So that was, you know, all about good and ethical leadership essential. And, you know, one of the things that you have to remember is that sometimes trustees, you know, board uh, directors of uh, NGOs are called trustees. Why the word trustees? Because they are to be trusted with assets, with money, with funds, with resources, and, you know, the whole uh, life of um, an organization. So uh, ethical leadership is key. Then my staff came also with the idea of transparency. And so while transparency is not trust, and, you know, uh, Julian uh, repeated this, uh, I believe personally that uh, transparency is important. We have to show where the money goes. We have to show where the funds of the donor um, are used for the purpose they are given to for, and that uh, we as humanitarian are good steward of the money that is given and trusted to us. So again, um, we also have to show that we are good at decision making and we have to be able to account for our decision uh, making process. And then there is, of course, the last one, but also very important accountability. And, you know, my staff stated that it's a key element for building trust and reinforcing trust. Uh, so we discuss upward, um, you know, accountability to the donors, but also accountability to the beneficiaries, the people we serve. And that was, you know, a key element of what they think um, trust is about. We have to be able to tell people um, our decision, we have to tell people the responsibility for the result of our action, the impact we're making, we have to be able to tell them the resource, uh, how they are used and so on. So in final analysis, you know, when I looked at, um, uh, you know, uh, the whole information, everything that I was given, I, I kind of came to a conclusion that was kind of, uh, uh, obvious to me, but that Fatima, who's, you know, as I said, the former head of partnership for UNHCR, a major donor, you know, like 8 billion estimated fund every year, you know, donated, um, given to uh, NGOs to deliver effective work. You know, uh, Fatima said to me, you know, what is NGOs have to show their trustworthiness? Are they trustworthy? You know, donors have put system in place to uh, assess NGO trustworthiness. And so by responding to those system, by you know, uh, being available for audit, for verification, uh, reconciliation, for going through the whole accountability process, we prove that we are trustworthy. So that was the donor's perspective that you know, I was looking at. And then I kind of came to my own conclusion on this is my personal view is that by large, the humanitarian sectors is trustworthy. You know, we are trustworthy because humanitarians are selfless. They are people who put the welfare of our fellow human at the heart of their work. That's what it all means. They respond to crisis, emergencies, and so on. So really, there is, um, you know, uh, the need for sharing credit and say that those people who are so utterly dedicated are trustworthy. And I looked for answer for that. And then I looked at one of the donors, uh, the Director General for International Cooperation, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Neverland, uh, Kitty van der Agent. And she said, for, most, for the most part, our trust in the humanitarian sector is well deserved. But there are occasional exceptions to improve aid effort. It is essential that those exceptions are found, addressed, and resolved. This is the only way to restore uh, trust where it has been violated. It's our obligation to both the people we assess and those who enable us to help others. So basically, definitely, uh, you know, we are trustworthy, but you know, uh, there is room for improvement. And so, I, I will conclude on this: that by making the humanitarian sector more accountable, by developing um, robust verification and reporting system, we will make our work. Uh, trustworthy to the donors. And finally, that's my personal take on this. We have to be more data driven. We have to be um, have a data revolution. We have to have numbers to show the impact we're doing in people's life. 
And by making the data revolution, we will have the numbers to prove to the donors that we are trustworthy. Laureen, thank you. Thank you very much. There's some great messages there. Trust and verify. Um, a good typical Russian proverb. I like that. Um, transparency is key. You know, you can only really trust people if you really are open and accountability in a systematic way. So thank you for that. I just want to ask you one question. Um, one person in the chat has been saying that, you know, listening is a really good sign of trust. If people are really listening, do you feel that you can trust your donors to listen to you when you criticize them without punishing you? And do you think the people you're trying to help can trust you to listen to their criticisms without you punishing them? Well, you know, this is all about, you know, uh, what I call um, open communication, that, you know, uh, the donors are available to, to listen to what you said. But it's all really about relationship and professional relationship where you sit as equal. You know, partnership is about equality. So that's one of the first commitment of partnership is equality. And so when you are equal, you can talk to one another without fear of retaliation. I think that's a really important principle we should hold on to that, you know, if we're going to be, have trust, it goes back to Babita's point. We've got to get rid of that hierarchical distinction, talk about we and talk about equality. So thank you for that. That's great. Leela in South Africa, we, a lot of us think of Oxfam, I certainly do, as a model. Um, can we can we talk about trust and how, how do you understand it in Oxfam? Why are you trying to develop it with, with partners? Bearing in mind you started partnering in 1948, so you should be good at it by now. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that takes us to about 82 years, I think, if I get my math right. And I guess this is the challenge here, is that Oxfam's an 80, 82-year-old organization that has had to evolve in order to stay relevant with the times, which I think is also significant for other organizations similarly in the sector. On the fact that it's not just about the, the money, I think that's kind of become a moot discussion over the years in the sense that, yes, it's a, the money comes in, but equally it's about how we show up on the one side, so that talks to our presence, which is really important. It's how we're structured. So are we role modeling the change we want to see in the world? So when you talk about trust, and I think for me, this is one of the significant changes that Oxfam is work, working towards. And, and I think it's, you know, it's a path that you keep doing is that the world has become so, um, so seamless in a way that accountability is accessible to everybody. So as an organization, we're accountable to anyone who can access who we are, can see the work we're doing in the world. And a mobilization around that happens in an instant with social media and all those things. So, so the, the question around us being present in a way that is, is, relevant to how we want the world to be. I think the role modeling of that, the structuring of that talks to the issues of power and privilege, which is the theme of this conference, is that for organizations like us who are committed to seeing change in the world, to affecting change in the world, we are held to a high standard around how we show up. So when it comes to trust, the question of do you walk your talk? is really important. And that also goes to the question that you spoke to Babita about earlier around, you know, how does power show up in, in the, the chapters? We call them affiliates in Oxfam between um, different size affiliates and the money they bring. And I think the way we've worked that is really about being committed to what we call a global balance agenda, which is about saying, how do we make sure that the drivers around what creates what creates that balance is not just about money? It's about voice and impact. It's about trust from our allies and partners. And it's equally about being locally rooted. And we do we are locally rooted in what we call multiple forms of presence. We have countries, we have regions, we have affiliates. And in the last probably 10 years, there's been a significant commitment to create what we call Southern Affiliates who are locally rooted in their country of origin with independent boards who define their strategy and how they work in their context. So locally rooted being context specific, shifting resources to where it's needed, having um, 
having decision making and structures that decentralizes decision making for us is has been equally important as it's been about embedding this behavior in our culture so on the one side you sit with the very tangible way of ensuring our structures are reflective of the organization we want to be in the world and on the other side it's about ensuring that all the way through how we are internally in the organization that we working towards embedding a culture that understands the diversity of who we are the people we work with and how to bring back together in a congruent way and having said all of that i would be the first to admit that that is a journey and it hasn't been perfect but the organization continues to try and i think this is the thing in in the space and the sector we work in is the accountability that florin spoke of is so important that we're not saying we're perfect all the time but when something does go wrong are we able to be accountable to the communities we serve and so so that is equally something that needs to be embedded in our culture and we continue to try and do that so for me it's a combination when we talk about trust of how you build complementary structures and systems to the experience you deliver to people in how you show up and having said that oxfam's also evolved in terms of of its voice and its presence in the world we do regard ourselves as a political organization advocating for um for the people and the issues we stand strongly for rights in crisis women's rights are just an example of that so our advocacy and campaigns is really strong our humanitarian work and our programming so the combination of having a one, what we call a one program approach creates a nexus that allows us to do both and constantly trying to find the congruence between those things and that is equally within the organization we have really robust conversations around how this works and that again is not to say it's perfect there constantly tensions within the organization looking to us to say how are we holding each other accountable so part of my role is responsible for the southern affiliate agenda i'm currently convening a conversation with the humanitarians in the organization to make sure that we can find a way to manage and live with a both and on both agendas and that we're not having tensions between those so for me the journey around trust is the the structures and the systems the complementarity of the behavior that shows up and that's embedded in the culture of the organization that then relates to the experience we we build in how people experience us in whatever space we show up in be that with donors we understand what our agenda is what we stand for and how do we constantly try to influence that with partners and allies it's also about language we don't refer to them to people as our partners we have people who choose to work with us people we work alongside people with whom we share knowledge resources and power in a space so that's been the the consistency of the journey for me that is really a coherent approach not just within an organization but equally within the ecosystem that we work in and trust is constantly making sure that the congruence of what you say um of walk the talk so what you say and what you do is something that people can hold you accountable to so yes of course we have to be data driven and yes we have to have systems and yes we must continue to produce the reports that we need to do but ultimately our accountability is in how people experience us when we show up and are we ensuring that the things we commit to are the things that people can see feel and experience every day and i think for me there's that that piece that talks to how can we make sure that we show the right kinds of solidarity we become a true network of peers and peers not just within the organization but within the ecosystem of the sector we operate in a horizontal influencing movement that truly listens to local leadership be rooted in local context be connected into the global because the role we play is not just about local rootedness it's also about bearing witness to some of the atrocities in the world and finding ways to influence to change that 
True solidarity also requires shifts in how power is used so that our power is not about an ambition to rule the world or to be the biggest NGO, but really it's about the power to change the world. How are we using that responsibly? How to sure that it's shared and understood with everybody um, that we work with um, and experienced in a way consistently with, with our allies and partners. So for us, Global Balance is not just an internal project. It is a political project that shapes how Oxfam acts in the world. So I'm mindful that we appear to have lost Hugo. Yeah. So Florine, Bobita, I mean, that's kind of the sense of, of who we are as Oxfam. And I can really yeah. see the connections that are coming through in some of the things you, you have said. Um, what do you think are some of the things that if we look into, we look at what's COVID doing, we look at the fact that we're entering the 21st century, what do you think we need to do or shift and change or build off um, for organizations moving into the 21st century? Right, well, you know, I think innovation for me is uh, the way forward. Um, so basically COVID-19 has shown us that, um, you know, we have to have the ability to, to connect uh, in a way that is modern with internet and access uh, uh, everywhere in the world. So basically for to be able to, to deliver on the 21st century, if you look at education program, we have to be able to give people access online for children um, um, to learn. We have also through uh, innovation, be able to deliver cash grant through telephones mm -hmm into people banking accounts. So that will help them uh, build their own, um, their own businesses, livelihood project and so on. So uh, we have to find innovative, innovative ways of delivering aid. And so basically we have to be within reach, within a second, within a few minutes online to every um, do donor, and every beneficiary. So 21st century is, I think, uh, uh, a century of technology, uh, but also when we deliver the aid, the aid online, we have, you know, like if they have a complaint, they can reach us through telephone, we log the information, and then somebody in the field will go and investigate. So we have to have very modern and robust way uh, of delivering online. So we don't, um, remove the presential, you know, the field work and so on. But we add on to that through innovation. So that's one of the way I think we have to go forward, strengthening our technology and also strengthening our technology, uh, not only for aid, but within our own organization and um, making sure that we have robust system, uh, IT system, ERP system, um, you know, we make the change within our organization to be able to deliver responsible uh, aids. The, the other thing I wanted to say is that we have to build trust in those area people. Yeah. Uh, that's very important to manage, um, you know, to see people as human beings, to see staff as human beings and, you know, uh, put the well-being at the heart of our work. Then we have to manage the behavior of our organization to build trust, so strengthening the organization through uh, good management governance system, and then our purpose to be faithful and loyal to the purpose, the vision of the founder of the organization. So I call that system of trust up, you know, people, organization, purpose. And if we are able to deliver on this, we have high performance and we have trust. That's my view. Yeah. Babita, I mean, and, and Florence talked a lot about technology, but one of the things that I think the shadow side of technology is the, um, the almost the, the shifting away from the human touch and the work in the humanitarian work does require very high touch of, of being able to access people. Do yes. you think that there's a danger with, um, the, 
I mean, how do you think that the use of technology could have the potential of reducing trust um, between organizations and, and the communities we serve? So, all right, so Alida, just to, uh, um, uh, you know, to what the point you mentioned and also to add on to what Florine said, of course, uh, technology has definitely been one of the, you know, an eye opener for us during this COVID times. Uh, uh, it does definitely talk about also sideline the human touch. But if I see from the other perspective, uh, during this difficult time of the pandemic, we did see a lot of uh, these local institutions coming on board. The culture of dependency actually reduced to a culture of giving. You know, like, for example, if I, I'm sure uh, in, in other countries it could be the same. Like in India, we did see households and neighborhoods coming out to reach out to the other people in, or, you know, in, in, in commonality, reaching out with whatever the resources they had. You know, so they, there was this whole, uh, the, the, the whole culture of giving, the whole culture of volunteerism, the whole culture of mobilizing, you know, whether it is resources in terms of human personnel or in terms of, you know, the, the kind or the cash or whatever you talk about, but the whole culture and the sensitivity actually has opened up. And that is something which has also given us an eye opener for organizations wherein we did not really have to much depend when this COVID crisis came in. Caritas mm -hmm. India did not really have to first initially depend much on the donors, but we had our own resources who were opening up. And within these resources, we were able to almost reach out to, you know, a large number of people wherein it was more of, you know, seeing from the biblical aspect, if I say, wherein, you know, uh, Jesus fed, uh, you know, the 5,000 men with just three loaves and two fish. So here we could see that beautiful example wherein with the minimum resources, we were able to actually reach out to a lot of people. This could only happen because we saw a lot of sensitivity amongst the community. And I believe that is something which has also opened up in this particular aspect of course, technology would take away those areas because accessibility and technology may not be accessible to everyone. Uh, and the marginalized may not have access to this kind of technology, what the some of the sectors would enjoy. But I believe uh, the other side of the good part of it is that this human touch has now become more progressive. There is more sensitivity, which is rising. Uh, organizations like us, we need to kind of create a balance. Yes, we need to see that and there is a balance between the two because that is right now the need of the hour. The technology is the need of the hour. But more importantly, to see how more and more people are coming on board and how we can make it available for everybody so that, you know, more and more accessibility is there at the community level and also the marginalization level. So, yeah, that's what I would just bring. You know, if I may, before I hand back to you, yeah, can I just kind of close out my comment on this discussion we were having um yes yeah, so I, I mean i say i have to agree with both of you i think on the one side the light is the you know the innovation that technology brings but i also think that COVID has made us realize and for me amplified the the, the importance of local humanitarian leadership because they remained at the front end of this crisis and continued to be available you know the humanitarian concept of neighbor helping neighbor wasn't, um, you know, an international organization flying in. I think that's the reality that we have to continue to build on. I think that's been the, the not necessarily eye-opener, but certainly the amplifier of that the, it's the local communities and therefore a lot, a significant amount of trust is about how do you make sure that you have a local, locally rooted approach? How do you ensure that, the, the, that resources and decision-making is closer to communities as opposed to sitting at a central place somewhere. So, so that, that I think for me has been where this, this has come through. And of course the use of technology to be able to distribute some of that has been, has been really, um, I think, something that we have to be able to build on as we move forward. So Hugo, just back to you. Thank um, you very much. I'm so <laughs> glad you were having a good discussion about technology while mine was crashing. So, <laughs> and the paradoxes. I moved to this village and we had an attack by a rat on our on our fiber cable last night. So um, a rat has eaten our fiber cable, it's being repaired and it crashed again. But um, I suppose in Britain these days after Brexit and then COVID, it's not surprising. We now have a plague of rats. So that's, that's the UK. It's 2020. <laughs> exactly. Rats still rule. 
Um, I just wanted to ask you all a question. I'm looking down the, the column a bit and I'm seeing, you know, people like Fikre saying, come on, we must talk more about power and privilege. But I wanted to ask you, because we're, um, you know, at a Berlin conference, I have to ask you a revolutionary question. And the question is really, you know, people often say that power is never really given away. It has to be taken. And what we're fundamentally talking about in this discussion of the sector is how we change power relations in the sector. Now, is trust really going to do it? Or is trust another slight diversion by those with power in the sector to find a sort of soft way of creating a, a diversion saying it's all about trust when in fact it's probably all about power? So my question to each of you is, can we really change the sector by talking more about trusting each other? In other words, can we reform the sector through more trust or will it take a revolution? And trust will have to be built after that change. So Leela, let's start with you again on that. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I, so I'm, I'm a little bit of a both and person, yeah? So I think that it's gonna take a bit of both on the one side, which I think trust for me is, has to be an ongoing process through which we build relationships. Um, the reality is, you know, in, in everything we do, the more we trust each other, the more we're able to share and do things. I think where the, the, the challenge comes in where relationships are not built on trust, but rather on judgment and where I decide, and this is where the power comes into play. Yeah? So if I decide, hey, you go, I think, hmm, not sure I can trust you and therefore I'm just not going to give you this, this and that. And, and we need to shift away from that, that judgment of based on, you know, the various things that don't make sense, the, those things that are based on ego, that are based on, on, on the things that have created the inequalities around power that we see today. I think for me, it is definitely a key part to how we move forward. But I do think that there's going to have to be some kind of, of revolution to shift some of the things. And I think COVID is one of those things, right, that we haven't been able to do ourselves, but here we have this virus that is doing it that that kind of revolution for me is where we now have to take that accountability and build off it and look at what it's amplifying for us. So like this conversation around being locally rooted, because the reality is the COVID responses have come from local responses, yeah. the major responses. And, and, and how do we build off that as opposed to kind of going back to the way we used to do things in the past? So for me, yeah, it. it's about taking every opportunity and building off that to move forward in a more enhanced way. So levering the, the revolution that's begun it. Yeah. With local action, mutual aid, and people getting on with it. Yeah, thank you. Florine, reform by trust or revolution? Well, I, I have to say that for me, trust is the foundation of all healthy relationship. So building trust takes time and requires active intent by all parties. So it's important to create a safe space for professional relationship and trust to emerge and develop. And especially when designing collaborative processes, you know, like humanitarian aid. So this can be done through open communication rather than revolution. I think that if we have open and honest communication throughout the process of delivering aid, if we recognize the importance of partners' input and contribution, and as my staff said, someone said sharing, um, you know, credit for the work done, then, you know, we can build a healthy working relationship. I think that as humanitarian trust is enhanced through transparency and accountability as well as discussed earlier. So, so, you're, 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 you're so I, I am a revolutionary because I'm French, okay. you know, African French. So by by design, I am a revolutionary. However, I do believe that in humanitarian, when we are working with vulnerable people, people who are fragile, who are going through such adverse city, who have gone through conflict, were can we afford to have a revolution? Okay. I don't think so. Okay. I go for peaceful means and, you know, trusting the process and, you know, discussing and agreeing um, to build 
collaboration, which are trustworthy. We kind of wore the revolution with people. Let's hear what um, Babita thinks in Delhi. Babita, are you, do you think we can reform the system by trusting each other more, or, or can you not trust people enough in power? You're going to have to make hard changes. I would just add on to a little bit of what uh, Lida and also Florine have mentioned. Uh, of course, revolution is something which all of us would want to see that, you know, the breakthrough. And COVID-19, I believe, would be one platform of a breakthrough which has touched everyone, all the organizations across, whether it's powerful organizations or the marginalized. So, but this whole trust eventually builds up, it evolves. And this trust can only happen as what as my colleagues have mentioned about the open communication, the constant dialogue that needs to happen. And this dialogue need not happen only at international levels, within the country, locally, it needs to take place everywhere. Because when we are talking in the same kind of a language, of course, we're talking with the same mandate, a shared mandate, if it is spoken at different levels at similar times, it does create that kind of an sense and impact. So I believe, yeah, so I do agree with more of a, in a wall, the kind of, a, you know, building a trust than a revolutionary kind of a breakthrough. So you think a wave of trust throughout the sector will create a revolution in the way that sector exists. Okay, I like that idea. That's, that's quite interesting. Now, look, Sylvia wants us to get more practical. Sylvia is asking us to give some concrete examples. So can I ask each of you, um, starting with Leela, to give a really practical example of where making trust, how it happened and how it changed the dynamics of aid. Leela, do you want to start with a real concrete example? Um, so for me, I mean, I think what we've been doing um, in terms of building our Southern affiliates, and I can talk to what we've done with Oxfam India and, and one new affiliate coming through in Colombia around the, the, the shifting of how we're working alongside partners, how we are building allies. And so uh, one of the terms we've been using in, in as we've built these organizations has really been about people seeing that we have skin in the game, that we are as invested in change as people in those contexts are. And I think for us, we've been able to see those shifts. They've, of course, there have been learnings along the way, but you can see the way in which the, the level of trust in what we bring, how we bring it, and what we, we're willing to share within that space has grown um, in, in both those countries, as an example. And, and so there's a difference for me in, in being what, what we call a facilitator. So you come in and, and there's no real you know, vested interest in what's happening, or a participant working alongside people to make change happen. And, and those for me are two practical examples that we've seen of how being locally rooted with independent autonomous organizations in, in these countries is making and starting to make a significant difference in, in how we work um, and what we're doing there. Thank you. Okay, and Florine, have you got a really concrete example of how trust was made and transformed one of your programs in with displaced and refugee people in Africa? Sure. I mean, uh, we do have, you know, a great partnership with UNHCR. And I think part of the partnership is to recognize, um, you know, the work we do, um, you know, they review the quality of the partnership at regular meeting and uh, they develop yearly reporting process, uh, action taken, improvement and so on. So when I visit the country program, I, I do have some time uh, you know, time with um, the country director from ARD and the country representative for UNHCR. And um, one of the best projects is the housing project they're delivering in Liberia. And um, this one of the, the, and the livelihood projects. And so basically, if you go to places uh, like Uganda or DRC, they're still building, uh, you know, um, mud houses. If you go to um, places like Burkina Faso, it's the Sahel region, so they have Sahel style of um, um, of shelters. But uh, in uh, I think in Liberia, they built concrete houses, which are like lovely, beautiful houses that you will find in suburban America. And so the cost of one house is uh, maybe more than what you, but it's built to 
uh, to make people stay. So it's decided, those people are aware that they don't want to go back, but it's not only for um, uh, you know, the people of concern, it's also for the host community. And so I think th the divide is 30 percent, 70 percent. But the beauty of the work, uh, it's giving people a chance to stay, to take root and to build new lives. And the livelihood projects give them means to live. So they have, you know, businesses, education, agricultural projects and so on. So I saw the money going to the beneficiaries and it's making an impact on them. I discussed with them and, you know, the trust they have for ARD and the trust they have for UNHCR is greater. So the, 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 it's teamwork, it's partnership and it's working. And wherever I have been, uh, I've seen, you know, returnees coming back from DRC to a uh, car uh, where, you know, you leave the kids out of the bus and they're home and they are happy to be there. And so you see the difference when you have a trusting partnership where you have team uh, delivering uh, humanitarian response that are effective and uh, making a difference to people's lives. So, so get, yes, I do believe in that. So and I have something to that. You get trapped from results. That's good to hear. Thank you. Babita, give us a real example of trust in action in India. Yeah, so in India, what, uh, like, uh, being a part of the Caritas uh, fraternity, so initially when uh, we used to have these, uh, you know, humanitarian responses and when donors coming in with this whole expectation, the to-do list, you know, how it needs to be done, to a journey where it has evolved to accompaniment and facilitation. So now the donors do not come with that expectation of to-do bag, but they are more about you know, accompaniment and facilitation to a process of promotion, promotion of leadership. And it has become to such an extent wherein we have campaigns which are happening uh, with Indian representatives going in uh, with, say, for example, Miserio. We have an example, beautiful example with Miserio. Every year we have these joint campaigns where we mobilize resources. We are taking all the testimonies from the country and we're going into different parts of, uh, you know, in Germany, we've done in different schools and colleges talking more about the kind of work that is happening down on the field. And that is how we have been trying to create a kind of a conversation and a communication amidst the communities wherein, because they are the ones who are helping us with the resources. So this kind of an open transparency has been initiated as part of for the partnership, uh, if I talk specifically of uh, Miserio with Caritas India. But of course, there are many more examples here, but then there has been a graduation from expectations to a complement and facilitation and moving on to promotion of local leadership. That is something which is now, as, as of now, if you see that members from international affairs are also part of the local committees within, you know, if you talk of like in India, we have the diocesan, in the, if you see that rate setup, we have the diocesan. So they're also part of the diocesan working groups. So that is the level of engagement now that we have across these partnerships. Babita, thank you. We're running out of time and I can see that um, some some people listening are not buying what we're saying. So um, Axel is saying, I still haven't heard practical examples of trust that is a humanitarian worker I can use. And Fikre says, we're just playing the game and being politically correct. And Alicia is saying this trust thing is paternalistic, if not racist as a construct. Uh, we don't trust you to know what is best for you. So we do the program. We don't trust you to handle the money like it's corruption, et cetera, et cetera. So it seems to me that you are all saying important things about the texture of trust in the aid relationship, how that has to be organized in advance, how systems can contribute, how you know sharing power much more equally and affiliate structures can really change things. But a lot of people are still not convinced that it really addresses power and privilege within the system. So we probably better leave it there. And it just means that trust is going to run and run. I want to thank you all very much. Apologize for my um, rat incident and crashing out for a bit, but thanks for carrying on. And thank you all for um, listening and watching. Um, we need to um, encourage you all now to go to the final session. It's going to be a great session, wrapping up the conference, and you'll have the chance to listen to Tamam Aludat, Anita Katakuri, Joan Okitoy Heisig, and Lina Srivastva. So please do go and listen to that. Um, keep working on trust, because we all need to trust one another as we do these important things, but keep also looking hard about whether trust is a diversion from power and privilege. And um, 
let's hope we get a wave of trust that creates that revolution as Babita hoped we would. Leela, thank you very much. Babita, thank you very much. Florine, thank you very thank much. You. And thank you all. Thank you, Hugo. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.